chapter twenty of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter twenty missouri free the temporary quiet which had been reached in missouri between the radicals and general schofield about the time of the november election in eighteen sixty three soon suffered a new interruption the legislature of the state met at jefferson city on november ten and the two principal questions before that body were the election of united states senators and the passage of an act to call a state convention to deal with the subject of emancipation the legislature was composed of members chosen a year before excepting that some vacancies had occurred which were filled at the recent election but several circumstances probably served to change its temper at the session of the previous winter neither faction having a controlling majority an effort to elect united states senators for the two existing vacancies and the following term had only partially succeeded the radicals claimed that their candidate for supreme judge of missouri had received a majority in the state of about seventeen hundred votes though the official count through technical informalities of certain ballots awarded the certificate of election to the conservative candidate with the chances of success thus evenly divided and vibrating between the two both parties were put on their good behavior a balance however that was soon destroyed by the death of governor gamble which occurred on the thirty first of january eighteen sixty four through this the conservative party lost its most conspicuous leader and from that time forward rapidly declined in prestige and numerical strength the first of these legislative contests was disposed of on the fourth day of the session by the election of b gratz brown the leading radical for the vacancy to succeed wilson and of john b henderson a conservative but also a hardy emancipationist for the coming full term to succeed himself to the united states senate president lincoln was greatly pleased at this result which appeared to him the forerunner of such cooperation in missouri as would secure an earlier and more substantial measure of emancipation than that adopted by the old state convention on the first of july previous in this he was not disappointed the radicals could not command a working majority of the members but a sufficient number of them had become convinced that slavery was doomed and were agreed that a convention should be held a parliamentary struggle however occurred over the time when it ought to be elected the radicals desired that the convention should be chosen and an emancipation ordinance adopted without delay but in this they failed and an act was passed which became a law on the thirteenth of february eighteen sixty four for submitting the question of convention or no convention to a popular vote in the following november and for the election at the same time of delegates with authority to act upon this and other enumerated subjects violent as had been the attacks of the radicals upon general schofield it was perhaps more than one could expect of human nature that with his vast and varied powers of administration he would remain entirely neutral in these new political contests and complaints of his interference began to reach the president mr lincoln's intimate friend washburn of illinois reported to him that he had held a conversation with the general advising him to use his influence to harmonize the conflicting elements so as to elect one senator from each wing gratz brown and henderson schofield's reported reply was that he would not consent to the election of gratz brown 
again when gratz brown after his election was about coming to washington he sent a friend to schofield to say that he would not oppose his confirmation as major-general if he schofield would so far as his influence extended agree to a convention of missouri to make necessary alterations in her state constitution schofield's reply as reported by brown to the president was that he would not consent to a state convention these things the president said are obviously transcendent of his instructions and must not be permitted and he sent for schofield to come to washington and explain the facts but the president also saw that schofield's mere interference was not the most troublesome point the reports brought to him by washburn and by gratz brown as of their personal knowledge would either be admitted or denied by the general if admitted he could not escape blame if denied the truthfulness of the president's trusted friend and that of the newly elected senator would be impugned the culmination of this difficulty and mr lincoln's tact in dealing with it are fully set forth in his letter to the secretary of war of december eighteen eighteen sixty three i believe general schofield must be relieved from command of the department of missouri otherwise a question of veracity in relation to his declarations as to his interfering or not with the missouri legislature will be made with him which will create an additional amount of trouble not to be overcome by even a correct decision of the question the question itself must be avoided now for the mode senator henderson his friend thinks he can be induced to ask to be relieved if he shall understand he will be generously treated and on this latter point gratz brown will help his nomination as a major-general through the senate in no other way can he be confirmed and upon his rejection alone it would be difficult for me to sustain him as commander of the department besides his being relieved from command of the department and at the same time confirmed as a major-general will be the means of henderson and brown leading off together as friends and will go far to heal the missouri difficulty another point i find it is scarcely less than indispensable for me to do something for general rosecrans and i find henderson and brown will agree to him for the commander of their department again i have received such evidence and explanations in regard to the supposed cotton transactions of general curtis as fully restores in my mind the fair presumption of his innocence and as he is my friend and what is more as i think the country's friend i would be glad to relieve him from the impression that i think him dishonest by giving him a command most of the iowa and kansas delegations a large part of that of missouri and the delegates from nebraska and colorado ask this in behalf of general c and suggest kansas and other contiguous territory west of missouri as a department for him in a purely military point of view it may be that none of these things are indispensable or perhaps advantageous but in another aspect scarcely less important they would give great relief while at the worst i think they could not injure the military service much i therefore shall be greatly obliged if yourself and general halleck can give me your hearty cooperation in making the arrangement perhaps the first thing would be to send general schofield's nomination to me let me hear from you before you take any actual step in the matter it would seem that stanton and halleck were not quite agreed to the changes proposed by the president for three days later december twenty one mr lincoln again wrote to the secretary of war in regard to the western matter i believe the program will have to stand substantially as i first put it henderson and especially brown believed that the social influence of st louis would inevitably tell injuriously upon general pope in the particular difficulty existing there and i think there is some force in that view as to retaining general s schofield temporarily if this should be done i believe i should scarcely be able to get his nomination through the senate 
send me over his nomination which however i am not yet quite ready to send to the senate the remaining obstacle appears to have been removed and stanton and halleck evidently yielded to the president's wish for two days later general schofield was duly nominated to the senate to be a major general but mr lincoln's difficulties were not at an end in his various interviews with gratz brown he had understood him to fully agree to the proposed transfer and he was much surprised to learn that that senator though perhaps keeping his technical promise not to personally oppose the confirmation was secretly encouraging others in opposition schofield's confirmation was secured only after some weeks of delay and upon mr lincoln's further solicitation he explained to senators wilkinson and chandler that grant and sherman for reasons which he did not understand disliked rosecrans but that on the contrary they had a high opinion of schofield and wished him to command a corps in their army that also while schofield displeased the radicals in missouri they would be satisfied with rosecrans and that the transfer would thus not only set matters at ease in both these places but would gratify the friends of schofield by his promotion and the friends of rosecrans by the important command he would thus receive it is needless to say writes wilkinson that when the senate fully grasped the plan of the president in this regard there was no longer any opposition to the confirmation of schofield the military administration of general rosecrans in missouri was thus begun in january eighteen sixty four under favoring conditions with the senatorial election completed and a new state convention provided the violent controversies of the previous year abated somewhat by a natural reaction but there existed so many latent elements of dissension and provocation that new difficulties were continually springing up for the better control of certain disloyal influences the general had deemed it necessary to issue an order through his provost marshal general that the members of the larger representative organizations of the various churches such as conventions synods and councils should before transacting their business take and subscribe an oath of allegiance to the united states this was resented by some of them as imposing a qualification not of a political but of a religious character the president deprecated every such restraint which was not seriously demanded and upon complaint he wrote the general the following mild admonition on the subject this is rather more social than official containing suggestions rather than orders i somewhat dread the effect of your special order number sixty one dated march seven eighteen sixty four i have found that men who have not even been suspected of disloyalty are very averse to taking an oath of any sort as a condition to exercising an ordinary right of citizenship the point will probably be made that while men may without an oath assemble in a noisy political meeting they must take the oath to assemble in a religious meeting it is said i know not whether truly that in some parts of missouri assassinations are systematically committed upon returned rebels who wish to ground arms and behave themselves this should not be of course i have not heard that you give countenance to or wink at such assassinations again it is complained that the enlistment of negroes is not conducted in as orderly a manner and with as little collateral provocation as it might be so far you have got along in the department of the missouri rather better than i dared to hope and i congratulate you and myself upon it military conditions like those in the political world were more favorable at this time in missouri as indeed they had become throughout the whole union the strength of the rebellion was everywhere declining east of the alleghanies general grant was beginning his great campaign against richmond in tennessee sherman was starting on his famous campaign through the heart of the south west of the mississippi the union forces had at the chief point such preponderant strength as left them free to take the initiative and a combined movement to ascend the red river and occupy eastern texas was in progress 
no confederate force was therefore free to threaten or invade missouri during the early months of the year eighteen sixty four although by the disasters which befell the red river expedition this came about later in the year the attention of general rosecrans was thus mainly taken up with local military administration in which the criticisms of the missouri factions upon him never became so extreme as they had been upon his predecessors for the moment the radicals declared themselves satisfied with him while the conservatives merely accused him of inefficiency and not of political bias this branch of the quarrel between the factions expended itself mainly on the party movements preliminary to the presidential nominations both the radicals and conservatives held their state conventions about the same time to appoint delegates to the republican national convention at baltimore each however accusing the other of designs adverse to mr lincoln's renomination it was alleged that the radical delegates would go to baltimore and demand as a condition of their adhesion that lincoln must reorganize his cabinet by dismissing bates blair and seward and that in addition a portion of them had sent a delegation with senator b gratz brown as active manager to the cleveland national convention to control the freemonters of that body in the interest of mr chase's candidacy on their part one of the principal leaders of the radicals wrote to the president in connection with a protest against the removal of general rosecrans from command though i do not think you have in times past treated the missouri radicals as kindly as you ought yet i desire and so do they except the german freemonters that the vote of this state should be cast for you i am one of the candidates for elector in the state at large and expect to do my part toward securing that result but all effort will be hopeless if it should appear that you yield in so important a matter to the solicitations of our adversaries almost every one of whom will in due time be found ranged under the standard of the chicago nominee you cannot afford thus to throw away the vote of missouri nor can the loyal men of missouri bear for a moment the thought of being trampled under the feet of the disloyal it turned out in the end that these factional movements and intrigues depended more upon drifts and currents of party feeling among the masses of their followers than upon the designs of individual leaders and that none of the several predictions were wholly verified senator b gratz brown and the more influential missouri delegates appointed to the cleveland convention neglected to attend the labors of that meeting turned to barrenness and its nominee withdrew from the canvas the conservative delegation to baltimore was excluded from and the radical delegation admitted to the republican national convention and the latter was the only delegation which cast its vote against mr lincoln's renomination under instructions they voted for ulysses s grant but immediately on the whole vote being declared they moved to make mr lincoln's nomination unanimous and it was done the bulk of the missouri conservatives with all their loud professions of support to the administration voted the mcclellan ticket while the missouri radicals as a party refusing till the last moment to acknowledge lincoln as their candidate nevertheless gave him the electoral vote of the state the summer thus passed away and the presidential canvass went on in missouri with no very marked incidents except the repetition of an annual rebel invasion this time again under leadership of general price who clung with pertinacity to his hallucination that missouri was rebel in sentiment and he her chosen deliverer after the union defeats in louisiana and the return of the red river expedition price gathered a force of ten or twelve thousand rebel cavalry in arkansas and moving rapidly northward entered southeast missouri thus changing his point of attack driving the union garrison out of pilot knob about september twenty six which delayed him by a determined resistance he next showed an intention of capturing st louis advancing a part of his forces to within a few miles of the city in this project however he failed 
by a hasty arming of the citizens as well as by the presence of an infantry division under general a j smith sent from cairo turning north and westward the rebels next threatened jefferson city but finding this also guarded they continued their course along the missouri river capturing boonville glasgow lexington and independence their march was greatly aided by the rising of guerrillas and bushwhackers along their route one band of these under a notorious outlaw called bill anderson atrociously massacred two parties of union prisoners they had captured and disarmed but they were followed and the leader killed a few days later meanwhile the various union detachments were being so rapidly concentrated against price that he began a retreat southward along the kansas border which was soon changed to precipitate flight a column of union cavalry under pleasanton fought the enemy in several sharp engagements and in one of them captured price's artillery eight guns and the rebel generals marmaduke and cabell with a thousand prisoners while the pursuit of the invaders was continued into arkansas the large accessions which price's invading column temporarily gained from rebel sympathizers were more than counterbalanced by the fidelity and vigor with which the union citizens either as enrolled militia or in other organizations assisted and reinforced the military detachments general grant afterwards rather harshly criticized general rosecrans for the impunity with which price was enabled to roam over the state of missouri for a long time but the history of the war had shown that heavy columns of veteran cavalry were not easily prevented from making raids of this character especially when as in this case they were willing to encounter the risk of gradual depletion and dispersion there seems little doubt that the raid was as much political as military all the summer general rosecrans had been receiving information of a movement of conspiracy in the state nursed by the order of american knights it was doubtless a part of that more general political conspiracy of secret associations extending through several northwestern states by members of this and similarly affiliated societies whose mischievous plottings and attempts inspired by the rebel authorities of richmond through their agents in canada are elsewhere related upon one point general rosecrans gave the radical party of missouri unfeigned satisfaction and as his action was in strict accordance with the instructions of the president and doubtless of his own judgment as well we may here quote mr lincoln's letter on the subject one cannot always safely disregard a report even which one may not believe i have a report that you incline to deny the soldiers the right of attending the election in missouri on the assumed ground that they will get drunk and make disturbance last year i sent general schofield a letter of instruction dated october one eighteen sixty three which i suppose you will find on the files of the department and which contains among other things the following at elections see that those and only those are allowed to vote who are entitled to do so by the laws of missouri including as of those laws the restrictions laid by the missouri convention upon those who may have participated in the rebellion this i thought right then and think right now and i may add i do not remember that either party complained after the election of general schofield's action under it wherever the law allows soldiers to vote their officers must also allow it please write me on this subject the orders of general schofield in the previous year simply used the phraseology qualified voters and forbade their intimidation or exclusion the order which general rosecrans issued to govern the election of eighteen sixty four went a step further and interpreting existing laws explained that this excludes from the right of voting all who since that date december seventeenth eighteen sixty one have been in the rebel army or navy anywhere and all who since that date have been anywhere engaged in guerrilla marauding or bushwhacking 
reciting that the civil power was too weak to execute laws and punish offenders he declared that violations of the election laws would be punished as military offences and that he would punish election officers as severely for wilful neglect of their duty as for its violation on the subject of soldiers voting the general's response to the president was earnest and satisfactory i should be untrue wrote he to the instincts convictions and professions of my life if i did not sacredly respect the right of franchise which lies at the foundation of our free government i should be doubly so were i to prevent or even neglect to facilitate voting by the noble and patriotic citizens who for the sacred cause of the union law and justice have become soldiers under my command whenever and wherever the laws of the state permit it it is sufficient to add that the careful provisions of the general's election order amply fulfilled his promise to publish one which would give satisfaction to all honest union men better however than the general's stringent military order was the great tide of anti-slavery conversion which sweeping over the north nowhere rose to a more surprising height than in this guerrilla haunted and war-smitten state the presidential nominations almost wholly changed the attitude of the factions towards each other the conservative party as such practically disappeared its voters of democratic antecedents returned to the democratic party and supported mcclellan its voters of whig and republican origin little by little fused with the radicals the political conditions and prospects became every way satisfactory to the president and his friends except upon a single point such important gains of republican members of the house of representatives had been made in the october elections in indiana ohio and pennsylvania as to afford reasonable promise that with continued success a two-thirds vote might perhaps be secured which would have power to propose to the states an amendment of the national constitution abolishing slavery throughout the union at this critical juncture a personal controversy about the nomination of candidates in the first congressional district of missouri had most unseasonably put two candidates in the field which would inevitably ensure the election of a democrat who would as certainly vote against such a constitutional amendment in this aspect of affairs mr lincoln deemed it his duty to interfere and sent one of his secretaries to st louis with a confidential message to the federal office holders belonging to the conservative faction that they must not labor and vote to defeat the emancipation candidates even though these called themselves radicals and were opposing his re-election to the presidency it turned out that the controversy about the nomination for congressman in the first district could not be composed and the democrat was elected as had been foreseen but in all other respects the election simplified the confusion of the missouri factions in a most refreshing manner in the previous november when the issue had been between radicals and conservatives without further definition of party creed the vote had been nearly equal but in the new issue between lincoln and mcclellan between the baltimore platform and the chicago surrender between prosecuting the war to success and declaring it a failure the result was an overwhelming triumph for the former lincoln received seventy two thousand seven hundred and fifty votes mcclellan thirty one thousand six hundred and seventy eight giving the president a majority of forty one thousand seventy two or of more than one-third the radical candidate for governor was elected by about the same majority of the congressmen elected eight out of the nine were radicals the solitary exception being in the first district where the foolish personal quarrel had thrown away victory a large majority of the legislature was radical the radical ticket was successful in eighty out of the one hundred and fourteen counties in the state and finally there was a majority vote of thirty seven thousand seven hundred and ninety three for the convention and three-fourths of the delegates elected to form it were also of the radical party the political revolution in the state of missouri was complete and irrevocable and it is only necessary to record the official embodiment of the popular decision 
the new constitutional convention met according to law at the city of st louis on the sixth of january eighteen sixty five and on the sixth day of its session january eleven it formally adopted an ordinance that hereafter in this state there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except in punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted and all persons held to service or labor as slaves are hereby declared free a telegraphic announcement of the event was sent to the legislature at jefferson city and in jubilation over the news the lower house of that body by a formal resolution turned from weightier business to greet with immense applause the singing of the famous war song john brown's body we can best measure the change which had been wrought in public opinion when we remember that this took place in the hall where less than four years before governor jackson and his rebel legislature belted with bowie knives and pistols and with rifles leaning on their desks concocted their treasonable enactments through a long night in a mockery of parliamentary forms also that this constitutional ordinance of immediate and unrecompensed emancipation was was now the mandatory will of two-thirds of the voters of missouri a state whose public opinion had tolerated if not justified the violation of law in almost every form by a portion of its citizens less than ten years before in order to compel the neighboring territory of kansas to adopt the institution of slavery yet it must not be hastily inferred that the passage of this ordinance of emancipation immediately restored peace and prosperity about a month later we find president lincoln writing the following letter to the new governor who had been elected and inaugurated to replace the provisional government it seems that there is now no organized military force of the enemy in missouri and yet that destruction of property and life is rampant everywhere is not the cure for this within easy reach of the people themselves it cannot but be that every man not naturally a robber or cutthroat would gladly put an end to this state of things a large majority in every locality must feel alike upon this subject and if so they only need to reach an understanding one with another each leaving all others alone solves the problem and surely each would do this but for his apprehension that others will not leave him alone cannot this mischievous distrust be removed let neighborhood meetings be everywhere called and held of all entertaining a sincere purpose for mutual security in the future whatever they may heretofore have thought said or done about the war or about anything else let all such meet and waiving all else pledge each to cease harassing others and to make common cause against whoever persists in making aiding or encouraging further disturbance the practical means they will best know how to adopt and apply at such meetings old friendships will cross the memory and honor and christian charity will come in to help please consider whether it may not be well to suggest this to the now afflicted people of missouri the action of the new governor in response to this appeal was not all that might have been desired he did not call the neighborhood meetings suggested by the president's letter but in his proclamation of march seventh eighteen sixty five merely invited all men who have not made themselves infamous by crime to unite together for the support of the officers of the law and admonished courts and officers to greater vigilance and activity how long the fires of these chronic neighborhood feuds might have blazed or smouldered cannot even be surmised for new events mightier than any mere local efforts were destined to bring them to a sudden termination end of chapter twenty end of abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay